Hi, my name's Phil Davis and I'm going to tell you a little bit about a drawing package called Inkscape. Now, I'm a scientist, I'm not an artist, so why am I so interested in a package like Inkscape? It's because a lot of what I do is about communicating ideas or concepts to an audience, whether it's the general public or its fellow scientists, and a picture speaks louder than words. So. Let me um, show you a little bit about what Inkscape is and how it works. Our, um, the sort of diagrams you might want to draw are um, quite varied in science. You might want to draw a line diagram like this activation energy um, diagram we see here. You might want to try and sketch a picture of a piece of equipment. Um, or do a, a kind of sketch of how an experiment might work. Um, or you might want to do something more complicated, like this tiger picture. Um, that's a degree of skill which I haven't acquired yet, but that's the sort of thing that you can do with Inkscape quite easily. Um, so Inkscape is a particular type of drawing package, and you may be familiar with things like Adobe Photoshop, which is a bitmap editor, and other ones you might know are uh, GIMP, which is the free version, or Microsoft Paint, which is um, the program that was um, distributed by Microsoft with um, Windows for many years. Inkscape is a different type of package. It's a vector editor. And what that means is that instead of editing a picture pixel by pixel, everything is described as an equation. And that gives you a number of big benefits. Um, the first one is to do with the way that the pictures stay well resolved regardless of whether you shrink them small or uh, expand them. So, for example, if we look at our tiger picture here, the whiskers on the tiger, we can expand right up. And I've done that with two packages. So the top whisker is with a bitmap editor. And although the image was really very well defined when we started, you can see the pixelation beginning to start on that um, whisker as it's been expanded up. The lower whisker was done with Inkscape and you can see how beautifully sharp that stays. What that means is that you could create a picture um, for A4 size for your thesis and blow it up to a naught size for a poster without any loss of resolution. And then the other big advantage of the vector editors is that the file size is much smaller. So a bitmap, this bitmap image for a tiger um, is about 1,200 kilobytes. A vector equivalent is 68 kilobytes. So that's almost 20 times less. It's a big advantage. Okay, so now let's go on to how, how Inkscape works, how you can start drawing a diagram. Inkscape is an incredibly powerful program. It has a huge variety of tools and menus that you can use, and it would take all day for me to do a proper introduction to Inkscape. All I'm going to try and do here is point you in the direction of the main tools, and then at the end of the video we'll show you some links to places where you can get other information. Um, so let's just have a look at the drawing um, workspace, the work canvas that we've got. On the left-hand side are the drawing tools, uh, a, a variety of functions, some of which are obvious, some are not. On the top bar, we've got um, control tools. There are things like the um, air, this, this area here is the magnify, so we can snap to, we can focus in on particular points of the image, but we can do that with the mouse as well. Um, there's a list of menu items on the very top bar, and those add um, another layer of complexity. So for the extensions, for example, you can do all sorts of things with Im images, you can render things, a huge amount that you can do. What I'll try and do here, oh, I should also put out the bottom bar. The bottom bar has got the colors and these t these this information bar, which tells you about the image that you're creating. Okay, so let me start with the most important aspects of an Inkscape picture. So if we take a simple object, so I'm gonna choose a square here and I'm going to draw, to draw a square, I have to hold down the control button 
and then it will confine the image to a square. So I now have a square drawn and I'll jump to the um, pick tool and you can see a number of things about the image. Now any object in Inkscape has two essential properties. It has the line around the outside which Inkscape calls the stroke and it has the fill inside. Um, so if I choose my object and I want to color the object then all I have to do is click on one of these um, squares in the color bar so let's make it a nice pink color and there it's pink if I want to get rid of that color if I want no color in the center I can click the crossbar and that disappears if I want to change the color of the line on the outside I hold um, shift down and I press the color bar and you can see that the color has now changed. Now that's quite a narrow stroke so it's a bit difficult to see the color but I can make that stroke thicker from this toolbar down here. You can see it's at the moment it's 0.5. Now the um, dimensions that we're using here are millimeters. You can see that's highlighted up there and it's also on the top bar here. So if I right click on that dimension I can change the thickness of the bar. So let's make it really thick. Let's go to 32. And you can see my object has changed completely, although the overall equation for this object hasn't changed. It's just got a very thick outside. So that, that's not really much use. Let's take that back down to one and you can see the color nicely. Now, I can manipulate my object in lots of different ways. Um, the most obvious is to um, expand and contract it. So any of these arrows, when I click on an object, these control arrows appear around it and I can use those arrows to to change the dimensions. So the corner arrow will change it in all in two dimensions and if I press control down it confines it so that the overall dimensions stay the overall ratio of x and y stay the same. I can also confine that by clicking this little padlock system there and now when I change it it, it can't do anything else. However I can change one dimension rather than the other from these side arrows and so you can see I can now turn it into a rectangle. If I click my object again the arrows, those control arrows, turn into um, rotation arrows and now if I grab them, if I grab the corner one I'm going to rotate my object. If I grab a, well let's put it back straight first of all so um, if we press Control Z, that will get rid of the last action. Somewhere in my toolbar, there should be a return. Oh, there we are, these return arrows. So I can redo that effect or undo that effect. And if I take this arrow at the top now, so not at the corners, that will skew my object like that. OK, so I have my object. And you can see at the moment, it is a rectangle with a hollow space and I can prove that by drawing something else. Let's draw, let's take a circle. So here's a circle. I'm going to fill it and my object now is above the square as you can see and on this toolbar here I can move it below the square. So you can see that the square is hollow and it is above my circle. These are fairly fundamental drawing tools but ones that you use all the time. Right, I think what we'll do is to demonstrate how um, powerful Inkscape is by drawing a simple flower. So first thing to do is draw some petals. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make my circle into an oval and make it petal shape. I want it to be um, not too big. There we go. Um, <clears throat> now if I look, if I just zoom in so the way I do that is hold control down and roll my mouse button either forward or away but there's also a zoom button here. My stroke is a little bit too thick for this petal so let's make that a bit narrower. So I'll right click that, it's one millimeter at the moment, let's make it 0.25. Yes that's quite good. Okay now when I click on my object a second time we can see the rotation bars there but we can also see this cross in the middle and that cross is the rotation object, the rotation center for our object. 
And what I want to do is have the object rotate around that cross, but I want that rotation to be from the end. I'll show you why in a moment. So if I click that cross, I can drag the rotation center and till it comes right to the end. Now what's annoying about this is I want that rotation center to be exactly at the end of my object. And if I try and place it by eye, of course I'm going to miss it by a millimeter or two. And that doesn't really matter for most drawings, but if I have to expand this out or I have to repeat this an, um, an action on this object many times, a small error now will multiply to give large errors. So what I need to do is to make sure that cross exactly hits the end of the object. And the way to do that, I'll just move it out of the way, is to use a property called Snap2. And Inkscape has Snap2. And this, is, this um, property has been um, propagated down into many things like um, the drawing packages in Word and PowerPoint. But it's very, very powerful in Inkscape. So this toolbar that's um, second from the top here is the Snap2 toolbar. So first of all, this button turns snapping on and off. And then these buttons here, don't worry about this lot here. These are for the bounding box, which I almost never use, so we won't worry about it. This allows us to snap to nodes, paths, and handles. Snap to paths, I'm just gonna click all of those. Midpoints of line segments, also um, centers of objects, and this is to Actually, I don't know what, the, oh, rotation center. They can be slightly different things, of course. Right, here's our rotation center. Now when I bring it in, it'll you see it jumped directly to, and there's a little message there that says it's been snapped to, let's just do that again, snapped to the quadrant point. So it's right at the end of the object, and that's exact. Now, what I want to do is produce um, a whole row of petals. So I need to copy this object and rotate it slightly. So. To copy an object, there's lots of ways you could do it. I could use copy and paste from the toolbar, um, from this toolbar here. But the easiest way to identically copy an object is select the object and then press Control D. And you can't see it, but there's a second object identical being produced exactly over the top. I can show that to you by um, if I use the the pick tool to draw a box around where both objects are, release, you can see this information bar at the bottom here tells you that there are two objects selected. Both of them are ellipses. Right, I just want to select one of those. I'll click again, and you can see the rotation center is, the rotation point is at the end there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold control down, grab one of these rotation arrows, and just move the object. And it will suddenly snap by a number of degrees. I think this is set for 15 degrees. So now I've got um, two of my objects. Right, I'm going to, to speed this up, I'm going to copy that. I'm going to control D. So I've now got a copy of both objects. And um, again, I'll hold control down, select both objects together, and rotate. Actually, that was moving it. So now you can see how to move. I'll control Z to put it back. Click again so that it's on rotate. And now hold control down and I can rotate it. And you can see how I'm beginning to grow my flower. I'm going to select all four this time. Control D. So now I've got a copy on top. And that, when I do that copy, the new object is the one that is selected. Hold, sorry, click once more so I'm on rotate. Hold control down, grab the corner arrow, and now I can rotate again. There we go. And I'll do it again. Uh, control D. Click once more. Hold it all the way down, and I'm almost there. Okay. Now, I don't want to. I don't think I need the whole thing, so let's just select this lot again. So if I control D now, then I can get this section to rotate, and I'm almost at the final position. I just need one more petal, that one, control D it, double click for a second time on the object, rotate by 15 degrees, and there we have our um, petals. 
and I think what we need is a little um, golden center so we'll have a circle of the golden center um, I'll hold control down so it draws it as a circle and not as an oval I think it ought to be bright yellow so I'll click on the yellow and there's the bright yellow um, I will have to give it a bit of an outside so at the moment it's got a 0.25 blue center I'm going to right click on that and I'm going to change it to a little bit darker and I think we should make that um, a nice dark orange so I hold shift down and then click on the color bar and that gives me my new color now when I bring it in you can see it's snapping to the point there we are that's what I want to do so it says object midpoint snap to the quadrant and there's my flower so that's an easy way to draw the flower now you may not need to do that very often for your uh, PhD thesis but I'm sure there'll be instances where those sorts of techniques are useful so let's draw another picture which is a little bit more science orientated um, and we'll show you an, a new set of skills with Inkscape so what I'm going to do is draw a sign code and I'm going to do that by starting with a straight line so um, actually I think what I need to start with is a square just to help me do the to direct the sine curve so I'll choose my rectangular tool hold control down so that it's forced to be a square um, and then I'm going to draw a line and this is the line this actually draws Bezier curves um, so this tool will draw curves extremely proficiently but the easiest way to do that is to start by drawing a straight line so select the tool click where you want to start and double click to finish and that's my straight line now what I want to do is turn that into a curve of course and the way you do that is choose this tool here which is called the node editor and you can see my line has two nodes one either side uh, either end and now what I'm going to do is just pick that line up with the node editor and turn it into a curve um, you can do you can move it wherever you want it's uh, it's extremely powerful but all I need is a bit of a curve here if I click now on the um, node you can see these control lines now these are the Bezier curve controllers and they what they do is control the slope of my line through the point where the Bezier curve controller originates so what I want to do is I'm going to move that Bezier and it should snap to halfway ah, I need to turn the snap to um, control bars on that will now snap to halfway down the midpoint of that line um, and then I'm going to do the same on the other side uh, actually let's make it a bit of an S shape here so there we are it's snapped to the handle at the middle point by using my square as my control box I um, ensure that my curve is very even so now I can get rid of my square and I've just got my curve um, now I want my sine curve really to go horizontally and at the moment it's going vertically so I'm going to use one of these tools up here I'm just going to rotate it by 90 degrees there we go now that's only part of a sine curve I need to make some more so what I'm going to do is control D so I've got a copy of that part of the curve and you can see that's okay but it needs to be upside down so again I can use one of these tools here this mirror uh, will sort of flip the object vertically and once again that snap to has brought my two points of my curve together so now it's a single line it's still two separate objects so if I click this one you can see that's selected and that one isn't um, I'll show you how to join those up now so what I'm do, going to do to join them up is I select both the objects and then I go back to my node selector and I draw a box around the two nodes which are um, connected and you can see at the bottom information it says here two of four nodes selected and if I go up to this toolbar you can see when the node editor is selected there's a number of things you can do and this these pictures tell you what that um, each one does so what I want to do is those two nodes I want to join to become one and you can see that is the button I need so if I click on that I've now got one curve so if I click on there I've got a single curve it's important that you do join these well 
it's sometimes important that you do join these lines up and I, I won't go into why now but occasionally that becomes important. Right now to produce the rest of my sine curve all I need to do is to create some more of um, these curves and add them together. So I'll control D, that makes a copy. I can drag the one copy over, it'll snap to. I can select both, I go to my node editor and I draw a box around the two nodes that need to be joined and I join them up. Okay, so now I've got a slightly wider curve. It's going to be too big for my page so let's make that a bit smaller and you can see that I can now distort my sine curve in lots of different ways. Um, okay, so let's do it like that and I think I'll make, make it a little bit longer so let's just snap that to uh, there and then use my node editor, take that point, join it together. I'm going to make one more copy, snap to, select both, node editor, pick up the node and join it together. Okay, all right. Now I thought what I'd do is show you some of the colouring options that this um, brilliant software gives you. Um, so the line is a bit thin at the moment, it's 0.265 millimetres. Let's turn that into a little bit thicker. There we are, nice thick line, that's very good. Um, um, I could add an arrow to the end of this, so let's see how we do that. So if I right click on my object, you get a whole new set of um, things that you could do. Duplicate is Control D, as you can see. But one of the th one of the options is Fill and Stroke. So if I click Fill and Stroke, I get a new control bar, which at the moment is minimised over here. So I'll just double click on that to open it up, and you can see it's got a number of options here. Um, in particular, the stroke style. So for example, at the moment, this line is a solid line, but I could change it to dots. Oh, that doesn't look very good. Uh, or dotted lines, that's slightly better. I can change the thickness. A lot of these are things that we know how to do in other ways. Um, or I can add an arrowhead to the end. So I can add a nice thin arrowhead. Um, we need to scroll along a little bit here. Um, or I can add a thicker one. Now you can see that arrowhead doesn't line up with where I want it to be. I think that small arrowhead is probably what I need. Um, and that's because the arrowhead is aligned with the slope of the line going through the final node. So I can change that again if I click on that node and now I can change the direction of my arrowhead so that it matches. I just have, there we go. Okay, right. Now I wanted to show you, let's just minimize that control bar. I wanted to show you how the coloring effect works. So I'm going to select my object and I'll go down to this toolbar here, which is to create a gradient. And I'll click on the gradient. And a new toolbar appears, and this toolbar gives you a number of options. So the first two is whether I'm going to create my gradient um, as a linear gradient or a spherical gradient, an elliptical gradient. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, and then is the gradient in the fill or is it in the stroke? Remember, the stroke is the line and the fill is what's inside it. Now, our present object doesn't really have a fill, so I need to create it in the stroke. Uh, I'll keep with a linear gradient for the moment and I'll show you a circular gradient in a moment. So now what I do, you can see that the gradient tool has got this little uh, cross and what I do is draw where my gradient starts and where it finishes and it doesn't have to be on the object. I'm going to start around here and you can see that the colour is filling in um, and I'll take it to the end here and unfortunately snap to is irritating me by um, forcing the object, the gradient to snap to the various points on the curve. I'm just going to turn snap to off with this button here so that I can place my curve, my color gradient where I want it. Now at the moment my color gradient goes from black on one end to um, it looks like invisible, no color on the far end, but I can change that. So all I have to do is click on the various nodes on my gradient here. So let's make it go from red into, well let's make it go to blue and there you can see I've got a nice gradient but I can control that as well if I double click on my gradient I've got another control point here so I could make this green not what I intended to do um, 
let's just undo that. I didn't seem to want to. There we go. I want to click on the control point and make that green. That's better. And you can see I've now got a bit of a spectrum running down the line. Um, I can also move that along the line as I wish. Um, so that's a linear gradient. And you can apply that to the fill of an object as well as a stroke. Let's try an example of a sphere. So I'm going to draw a sphere. And at the moment, uh, that's not true. I'm drawing a circle. Um, I need my outside line to be a bit thinner to make this look good. So I'm going to turn that to about 1. That's still a bit thick. I think we'll go down to 0.5. There we go. That's nice. Um, now, that's a circle. I can apply a gradient. I could apply a linear gradient, for example. Let's have a look at that. So I click the linear gradient. And this time, instead of creating it in the stroke, I'll create it in the fill. And all I do is draw it across. And you can see the same sort of thing as we saw with our um, sine curve, but this time it's in an object. I'm going to just delete that gradient by just hitting delete. And instead, I'm going to show you what a circular gradient looks like. So this is a circular gradient, and this gives you a gradient in two directions. So I'm going to click on my object. Don't worry what it's done to the color initially. We'll change that, and I'm going to change it. And you can see how that gradient can change. Now, the color gradient we've got at the moment is from white to a center of green. Um, doesn't look particularly sphere-like. So what I want to do is change the outer color to my green. And I'll change my inner color to a white, so as if there is a little bit of light shining on my object. And when I bring that up there and I click away, you can see that it looks a little bit like a sphere. Um, and now what I can do is I can create, well, uh, let's just double that one up. I need to turn Snap 2 back on. Let's snap that together. And you can see I can produce a row of atoms very, very quickly. Um, so that's going to snap to there. And all of a sudden, I need to make that a bit smaller, I think. There we go. And now by copying what I've already produced, I've produced very quickly um, an illustration of a surface. I think this is a face center cubic 100 surface, but you probably don't need to know that. OK, so that's um, another set of tools that you can use to create interesting images in Inkscape. As I said at the start, I've only touched the surface of what Inkscape can do. And we'll finish this uh, presentation with some links to other places where you can find information. But one final tip. When you want to draw a diagram with Inkscape, the best way to start is to look into the internet to see who's drawn that diagram already. Inkscape files are saved with um, a file um, uh, a file name that ends in SVG, SVG. And um, if you search the internet for SVG files, you'll find abundant numbers of files that you can download and modify yourself. Many of them are uh, on Creative Commons license, so you can use them and edit them yourself. And that's usually the fastest way to create a diagram. If you want to do a, a particular piece of equipment, if you want to draw a car, if you want to draw a, an exhaust pipe, you're likely to be able to find a diagram that's already been drawn. If you can't, then Inkscape is also extremely proficient, proficient at, um, at tracing pictures. So I'm not going to show you how to do it here, but um, you can import images into Inkscape, trace them, delete the bitmap image you've just imported, and that tracing is there as a vector image which you can then um, use uh, for yourself. So we're going to finish now with um, a slide uh, of links that you can follow to learn a bit more about Inkscape.